rugby is a tough game for tough players, but are they putting their brains at risk? You're looking at Six Nations matches where there's a player per match, on average, getting a brain injury. That's, that's not set the level of a brain injury for sport. Reports of concussions have doubled in five years, sometimes with tragic consequences. Concussion can be fatal, and that was a term the sporting bodies didn't like. You know, and I said, well, you just prove it. You know, I have a death certificate. I know what it's like to play at the highest level. Now, as the World Cup brings the sport center stage, I've traveled to meet scientists who believe my sport may cause serious brain damage in later life. I would not want a son of mine playing rugby. There's good evidence that it's a high-risk sport. It's time to tackle the truth about rugby and the brain. John Beattie, John Beattie on BBC Radio Scotland. Today, the new leader of the Scottish Labour Party, Kezia Dugdale... Says I'm John Beatty. I'm a BBC journalist. I present a radio show on Radio Scotland every day. But in a previous life, when men were men and shorts were short, I also played rugby. Blanco, charged down by Beatty. Clear run into the line. Beatty, the levelling score. I played for Scotland and went on two Lions tours. So, John Beattie's industry rewarded with the superb challenge. These kids are starting out in a sport that's grown beyond my generation's wildest dreams. It's played by over seven million across the globe. The World Cup is set to generate over two billion pounds in revenue. But there's an ugly side to the game too, and an emerging problem, concussion. If one incident served to put concussion on the agenda, it was this one involving George North, playing for Wales against England in the Six Nations this May. Now I've played a bit of rugby, coached a lot of rugby and watched lots of rugby. And when I saw it, I felt sick switched the telly off and went outside. Now the medical team who cared for George North that day have agreed to speak about it. He had a head knock uh, from, a, from a stray boot. Um, we decided at that point we were unclear whether or not he, um, he needed any further assessment or not. So because of that, we actually took him off the pitch uh, and he had a 10 minute assessment. George North clearly is kicked in the head. Prav Mathima and his team didn't think he was concussed. But because they'd seen a head knock, they followed Elite Rugby's rules and took him off the pitch for a 10-minute head injury assessment, or HIA. He passed and played on. At home, Barry O'Driscoll, a former Ireland international, doctor and medical advisor to World Rugby, was watching. And the use of a 10-minute concussion test made him frustrated and angry. HIA, as far as I'm concerned, is, is meaningless and, and can do more harm than, than, than good. It's tokenism, that's all. Why don't you give them 20 minutes, you've got six subs? Why don't you give them half an hour? Because it's known that if you put them through an exercise session, it, it can bring on the symptoms. That's, that's not done. In the second half, George North was knocked out cold. Rugby's rules say he should have been taken off immediately, but Prav and his team missed it. My view was unfortunately obscured, um, but all I saw was George getting up off the floor. Um, assessed him uh, at that point, uh, and at that moment felt that he was fine to continue. We did about on-pitch assessments, uh, and at that moment felt that he was OK uh, to carry on. Uh, the game concluded, uh, and it wasn't until after the game where we actually reviewed the video footage where we saw uh, what had actually happened. We saw that George clearly has a, a momentary loss of consciousness. Uh, and in that incident, you know, uh, we all knew that uh, he should definitely have been taken off the field of play at that moment. So in front of thousands in the stands and millions watching at home, George North was left on the pitch after a concussion, breaking rugby's rules 
and putting his health at risk. It's giving dreadful, dreadful uh, example to parents and kids watching this that uh, players like George North are, are patently concussed. And so, so do you think then, sorry to interrupt, that at the moment, the way elite rugby treats concussion means it's too dangerous? Oh, um, yeah, yes, I think uh, it, it's... It's, well, not, then, it's not worth the risk. It's not worth the risk, no, no, no. The decision to leave George North on the pitch caused rugby at the highest level to look at how it spots concussion and make immediate changes. We are now supporting the, uh, the doctors and the medical staff with backup videos and in the World Cup it will not only be backup but it will be also supported by Hawkeye which gives us 16 to 20 views of the incident. But the 10 minute head impact assessment will be kept in an attempt to catch more suspected concussions. We can't diagnose a concussion within 10 minutes. All right, so the HIA is the step to getting to suspecting concussion. Yes. We're looking for people with suspected concussion. We are not trying to diagnose concussion with the HIA. So what is it about rugby that can cause concussion? It's not simply a matter of a direct blow to the head or being knocked out. In fact, only one in 10 concussions result in a loss of consciousness. The brain is only loosely secured in the skull and it's jelly-like and soft. So any sudden movements, particularly the kind of wrenching and twisting forces generated in collision, can cause the injury we call concussion. This is when nerve cells can be temporarily damaged, causing symptoms like dizziness, nausea, memory loss, and even personality change. And those symptoms can persist, turning into post-concussion syndrome, lasting for days, weeks, or months. This is how rugby promotes itself. The Six Nations publishes a top six hits and tackles on its YouTube channel. I worry this is what we're encouraging. Faster, bigger players taking each other out irrespective of the risks. Fellas, fellas. Andy Hazel retired last year after 17 years as a pro rugby player. Hi John. How are you Andy? You well? Nice to meet you mate. Nice well, to meet you. Well come through. Looking well. He's seen the game get more physical, yep. more brutal. I think even since I retired it's gone up a level again and I think for me that contributes to you know the Head knocks. Yeah. Do you think it does? Do you think that kind of... Because you can imagine, can't you, the, the collisions of two people, two massive people, bang. Whereas in the olden days it was... So you think it's getting... I think having I'll, a bigger effect on concussions? I think it's, it's not so much the one-off contact, but I think it's the repeat concussion, you know, the, the repeat hits that maybe it's not helping, where, you know, it's not head-on-head, head, but it's just heavyweight collisions, just bang, bang, bang. I can feel the hits getting bigger and bigger, and, you know, if you just ran up right like that, you'd get absolutely crucified, you know? <laughs> you know it was the way it was. In a way, that's what I, I enjoyed that more about the game. Um, the more sort of physical and brutal it got, I sort of, in a weird way, I sort of enjoyed that and relished that challenge. And we're still going to have a try, oh, here we are, and Andy Hazel does finish it off with a flourish. It was post-concussion syndrome that ended Andy's career. It caused depression, restlessness, and, for a time, changed his personality. He's recovered now, but is he concerned about long-term damage to his brain? That is a worry. You know, it's, it's, it's a horrible thing to think about, really, because obviously your brain is, is, is you know, it's, it's something that, that is, it governs everything. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, I am worried. I try not to try not to think about it, but I think well, only time will see. Mm. You know, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. So I'm hearing that the elite game I played and loved may be getting more dangerous. Bill Bowman, just a little touch of anxiety, perhaps. Bill Beaumont was one of my most formidable opponents, but he was also my Lions captain 
and a great friend to have on tour. I'm back at Twickenham to tackle him again. Now he's part of the establishment, the RFU chairman. The union's own figures show concussions went up by 59% last year. Though they say that may be because of increased awareness, not a tougher game. It's all basically the same game. You think? You don't think that you honestly telling me you don't think the hits are harder? I think there was a stage when the game did go pro, when the emphasis was on size, was bulking up and bigger, bigger hits. But certainly now, I think over the last 12, 18 months, I think there's more of an emphasis on more speed around the game. I do. I do think the players they are looking to do more running than actual more gym work. Oh, white hammer to a tackle, gives it to BT, BT. Oh, my word. My son Johnny has followed in my footsteps. His generation of players undergo concussion awareness training. The sports made them far more aware of the dangers than we ever were. Bill's son is an elite player too. Are the risks for our boys worth it? I think, well, actually, do the benefits of the game outweigh the chances of you getting a serious sort of uh, illness, you know, that's what it would be, then yeah, and I think like in all things in life, there has to be a balance. Worth taking a risk. I'm not sort of, you're not going to put words in no, my no, mouth no, no, about it, but all I'm saying is that I have gained a great deal out about, about the game of rugby. Millions of other people do. And I think as long as as administrators that we do our best to recognise that if a player is injured, then we, we make certain that we look after them. This is modern rugby. Get in the gym and get big. These boys play for Mosley, a second-tier English pro side. The RFU insists they all undergo concussion awareness training. But will players themselves admit to a head knock if it means they'll have to go off the pitch? You ask anybody here, they'll play on. So it's not down to the player. So basically, as players, you're saying, look, the game has to take us off the pitch? Yeah, it's because we'll play on whatever. It's, it's the coaching staff, the medical staff that have to make a decision. You're a young lad, you're playing for England in the Rugby World Cup final and the doctor says, right, now I think you've had a head knock off the pitch. Oh no, I'd do everything I could to stay on. Yeah, it's the ultimate dream, isn't it? I think it'd be devastating to have to be dragged off in a situation like that. Even knowing what you know? You're young, yeah. even knowing yeah. what you know? It's difficult it though. It'd be damaging <laughs> your brain forever, you say, I'd rather keep me on the pitch. The earnest would probably have to be on them, yeah. yeah. I'm going to give you a count to three. The time will start when you close your eyes, OK? Yep. So, one, two, three, close your eyes. Lovely. The Mosley players are involved in research here in Birmingham into concussion testing. Current tests can be cheated if players deliberately score low on reaction and balance tests in the off-season. And that makes it easier to hide a concussion later. We know that that's happened. That's happened for Do you, years. Do you know it's happened? Yes, we know it's happened. Uh, it's uh, happened we've, for we've, years? We've, 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 we have had players tell us that that's what they do. Okay. So we, we and, I, and I think that's fairly common. Because remember, their, their job is to get back out into the pitch and play. Um, what we're trying to do, though, is develop physiological tests that, that help with that decision, because we can't fake a physiological test. Some of these tests look pretty futuristic. So I'm going to be able to watch my brain being stimulated, is yes. that right? By that coil and it should make this arm twitch. This one I'm trying measures how quickly my nervous system responds to an electrical signal. One day they may make pitch side diagnosis of concussion completely objective and scientific. Until then it's up to players and officials to spot concussion and not spotting it can have tragic consequences. Peter Robinson coaches his son's football team in Midlothian. 
All his kids play sport, but the families paid a heavy price. He shows me a video of a rugby game his eldest son Ben played in 2011. We've agreed not to show what happens in detail, but Peter talks me through it. This is the actual slow motion that's Ben going into the tackle, oh. and there he goes down, and you can see not even a hand out to protect himself. It's a yeah. chest on chest, yeah. head to head. Yeah, you can just see that, you know, his head's the first thing plays into the ground. It's just... The video shows Ben down after a tackle. He was assessed and allowed to play on. And this is the penultimate injury. Ben tackles the centre. Yeah, he you actually in. here, he flies and tackles him. If you watch Ben's arm, he doesn't move. His arm's up. You he's see, look, it's just... Oh, well, he's out. And this is the last instant that he, he doesn't recover no, from. He's lying on his back. Ben never regained consciousness. He died later in hospital. A coroner ruled he died from second impact syndrome, the result of multiple concussions in the same game. It's horrible to watch. Yeah, yeah. To think about it, if he had a blood injury, he'd have been removed. Yet with a brain injury, he's kept on. The best thing, he could have been split open. He'd been taken off at least. Or broken his leg. Yeah, yeah. Terrible. Yeah. Terrible. Peter now campaigns and educates on concussion. Ben's case is part of the education modules used by rugby unions in the UK. The message is simple. If in doubt, sit a player out. It's all about informed choice. You need to let people know what the ultimate risk is. And with concussion, concussion can be fatal. And that was a term the sporting bodies didn't like. You know, and I said, well, you disprove it. You know, I have a death certificate, you know. So it's very simple, actually, and that's the thing. It's, it's so simple, you know, if in doubt, set them out, really is. It's a quick fix, you know. If somebody, it's like I say, what is it about keeping a kid on with a brain injury? Why would you keep a kid on a field with a brain injury? Down the outside, Chris, quick, down the outside. Now, after watching that video of Ben's last few moments with his dad, it's hard to come away without thinking that if he'd just been taken off the pitch after that first head knock, he could be alive today. And that's something Peter has to live with, but it's something rugby has to live with too. Thankfully, Ben's tragic story is unusual. Fatal concussions are rare. But can players with a long career behind them, like me, still face serious problems later in life? Beneath the glitz and glamour of American football, there's been a dark story that's played out over the last decade. Retired players were suffering from a range of symptoms, suicidal thoughts, memory loss, violent behaviour, and that's led to a debate about whether concussions in contact sports can cause long-term brain damage. The debate on concussion in this country isn't just happening in isolated spots. President Obama hosted a conference on concussion here at the White House. And later he said if he'd had a son, he wouldn't have let him play NFL for fear of being concussed. This topic is being talked about in every bit of this country's society. I've come to a hospital in Massachusetts to meet one of the people who started that debate. Anne McKee took me to see her brain bank, a freezer full of athletes' brains. <laughs> so, each frozen. one of these, right, frozen, uh, about about 150 brains in each freezer. We're always looking for Alzheimer's or changes like that, Lewy body disease, and especially in the former athletes, we're looking for a disease called CTE. New brains are donated all the time, those of American footballers and other athletes. The big concern is a new form of dementia, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, and thinks it's linked to collisions on the pitch. It's not the 
getting knocked out that we're finding in our research. It's really the uh, the length of exposure, the, the numbers of years the number that you play at a high level. Even even if you weren't aware that it was causing any trouble, yeah. it was just part of the game. And that's really the danger with football. Work here in Boston has found this brain disease in over a hundred NFL players. Researchers believe that repeated blows to the head, concussions, are causing brain damage. The longer your career, the more the risk. And there's worrying news for rugby and potentially me. Anne has also examined the brain of an Australian rugby player and found the same damage as NFL players suffered. This man got sick in his 50s. He developed behavioral problems, uh, uh, you know, outbursts, ir irritability, and then a lot of memory, uh, uh, cognitive problems and memory. Uh, finally became severely demented and died at, in his mid-70s. Uh, and his brain ha is a classic case of uh, what we call CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Researchers here admit their sample is a small one, a few hundred brains and it's biased towards those who develop dementia symptoms after playing sport. After all, those are the people whose families donate brains for study. But Anne can now point to a decade of work linking head trauma in athletes, autistic patients who bang their heads, and military veterans to CTE. I would not want a, a son of mine playing rugby. I, I think there's, there's, there's good evidence that it's a high-risk sport, and I'd want to avoid that. Uh, but I do think, you know, we just need to allow everyone to make their own informed decision. One thing Anne can't tell me is whether I have CTE. Currently, only a dissection of a brain post-mortem can confirm a diagnosis. Well, I'm no clearer to knowing whether my brain's been damaged in rugby or not, but having spoken to Anne, it's pretty clear that she is saying that rugby is giving players repetitive head knocks. And some of those players, because of that, will be getting CTE. My trip here was uncovering worries about the long-term impact for me and hundreds of thousands of people who play rugby back in the UK. The first CTE cases emerged in American football, so I've come to the NFL's impressive Park Avenue headquarters to hear their side. The question from the scientific perspective is, is there a correlation or a causation? As I understand the internationally accepted consensus, there is, causation has not been proven to this point, but that's not going to stop the league either, A, from investing in the research but B, also more importantly, to treat our players conservatively as, a re as it relates to concussion, making sure that our return to play protocols are conservative, ensuring that we're spotting the injury as frequently as possible. So the NFL think the case hasn't been made conclusively, but they have provisionally agreed a billion dollar settlement for former players who claim the game harmed their brains. None of the NFL franchises wanted to film with us, but the East Kilbride Pirates welcomed me with open arms. The interesting thing is that, despite questioning the link between head trauma and CTE, the NFL has acted to reduce concussions in the game. Previously, it used to be, if you can get to him, you can essentially do whatever they want. The term sack comes from, it's essentially like putting the guy in a sack and beating him with a stick. That's, that's where the term came from, so it was like, do as much damage as you can. Now it's, no, this guy's protected because we need to protect these players. So what we're watching now in American football, you're going to throw the ball. Yes. And you come in. And he comes in to tackle him. If he comes in and makes head-to-head -head contact of any kind, we've, that's now a straight ejection from the game and you're banned for a fuller game. That's changed to protect, yeah. protect players' brains. Yeah. So your game's changing even at this level. Yeah. In NFL, concussions are falling, unlike rugby, where they continue to increase. The number of concussions in our sport over the last three years has dropped 36%. Then, and notably, the number of concussions caused by that helmet-to-helmet -helmet hit, 
that has been affected by those rules changes has decreased by 43% over that same time frame. So if you take out the, what were the most dangerous hits in our game, the helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact, um, not saying we're done, not by a long shot, but if you address it through rules changes, protocol changes, coaching changes, and, and credit to the players for changing their behavior, um, and you enforce those rules changes, what we've seen over just the last three or four years is a significant drop in the number of concussions. Reported concussions in rugby have doubled in the last five years. Even if that is due to increased awareness of the injury, the next step must be to bring those figures down. World Rugby is reviewing 900 videos of concussions and they're looking at the tackle and thinking about changing the game's laws. How can we actually change the game, or change the laws of the game, or change whatever it is to, to make the game safer? The biggest area where concussion is going to occur is in the tackle. So that will help us to look at the tackle and see what we can do to make it safer. Which is an old game means we might tweak the tackle law. It could be. I think that they, they, they are, my, my job is to identify a risk and then I, and look for solutions and then present those solutions to the, to the lawmakers to make the changes that will bring about protection of the athlete. This is Willie Stewart, a Glasgow-based neuropathologist. He's an influential voice on concussion in the UK, helping many sports improve recognition and treatment. He thinks change in elite rugby is overdue. Are we going to accept every time there's a Six Nations match, at least one rugby player is going to go off with concussion? Is that an acceptable level of injury? Of course it's not. You know, one out of, of 30 players in a park who's going off with brain injury is totally unacceptable. But your fear is one day somebody says you'd be mad to play rugby. I, I'm already hearing that. You know, I'm already hearing you know, people saying, you know, I wouldn't let my kids play rugby. I try and argue against that whenever I can because you know, I think rugby is fantastic. Willie brought me to his own brain bank, where he's researching links between sport and long-term brain damage. And there's something he'd like from me. And do you need more brains? Oh, unquestionably, yeah. We've only looked at a few hundred at most of this type of pathology. We need to see more. Have you got room for my brain? We should be possible. Just about, yeah, there's a small corner where I'm sure we could fit your brain into. Um, OK, when I die, you can have it. OK. We'd be delighted. Shake but uh, hopefully that's going to be a long time away. Shake the money. So in my own small way, I'll contribute to understanding what impact rugby is having on our brains. I love this sport. It's given me a lot. It's a big part of my son's life too. I want rugby to be a part of millions of people's lives for years to come. But we have to be sure we're doing everything we can to protect them and their brains. Well, next on BBC One, a controversial find in the attic and the chance to meet an elephant osteopath in all change at Longleat. And over on BBC Three, they need to overcome their fears and turn ideas into prototypes. Girls can code.